Welcome to our Sunday service here at Ridgeway Community Church, Redditch. Glad that you can join us as we worship the Lord together. We welcome Peter Coggins as our guest preacher from Wood Green Evangelical Church in Worcester today. So he'll be sharing from God's Word a little later on. So I trust you'll be blessed as you join with us. So let's begin, shall we, by singing praises to our God in the words of this lovely song. Our first hymn this morning is Forever by Chris Tomlin. Through music, 
through words and through your preached words. It will speak to us, Lord, through your spirit that we may go away taking something with us that will bless us for the next week. So once again, Lord, we ask that you take precedence over everything here this morning, that at the end of it all, we may lift up and praise the name of Jesus. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is You Are My All in All. We stand to sing. come and share my testimony. So um, this year, earlier this year in February, I moved to England with my husband Joel and we were living in Taiwan for the last five or six years. And so um, I was born in Taiwan and maybe some of you don't know where Taiwan is or heard of Taiwan, 
But if you've heard of bubble milk tea, um, that's originated from Taiwan. Uh-huh. And my dad, uh, my my husband asked me, what is this? What's this bubble tea for? What is it? Inside? Yeah, it's um, tea with milk, um, with brown sugar, with tapioca, or you can add anything in it. It's a really good drink. Um, and if you, um, everyone got, everyone's got a phone, right? So the semiconductor, the chip inside, most of it is made from a Taiwanese company. In Taiwan, there are several big manufacturers that make those. And Taiwan is just located um, east of China, so it's a really little island. And um, it's a really cool place to live in. So I was born um, and raised there, and my parents, um, we, my parents are, they're not Buddhist, but most of the Taiwanese follow folk religion, and what that means is they worship ancestors mostly and some other deities, and during certain holidays, you would need to um, do certain worship and giving thanks and giving food to those ancestors and deities. So I, w- I grew up in that kind of environment. When I was in elementary in first grade, my English teacher, I went to an English language school, by the way. My English teacher, she was from Jamaica, and she shared the gospel to the whole class. And she was my teacher for three years. So during those three years, she would be consistently, constantly sharing the gospel and reading Bible stories to us, and she would pray with us. So that's how I knew um, the gospel. And so at that time, the seed was planted inside my heart. But I was still following the Taiwanese traditions along with my parents and my other family members. I thought Jesus was real, and I thought the other gods are real too. They, they are all real. It wasn't until when I went to America when I was 15. I went to a high school there, and I lived with a host family who are Christians. So that's when I started to go to church, and that's when I got to know Christianity more. And during those years, um, I grew closer to God, but I didn't really know Him. I didn't really have a relationship with Him. It wasn't until I went to university in Nebraska that I met many people, and and God used many different challenges and to shape my heart. And at that time, I went to a conference called Passion. It's, um, it's a huge conference in Atlanta, Georgia. And at that time, I met a girl from Taiwan, and she shared her testimony to me, and she shared how she was living in fear um, for many, many years, and how God set her free from that. And that's also how I felt um, during my time when I was living in Taiwan, growing up there. I felt like I was living in fear um, for many years. Um, for I don't know why, but I know that because people worship fake gods, they worship deities, and those are the strongholds that are holding people. So that's why people are living in fear and worshiping them. But it felt like through her testimony and through um, God placing people in my life, it felt like God has unveiled some a blindfold that's in front of me and now I can really see for who he is and he put people around me and I had a community at that time so I really truly knew um, at that time I know who God is and who Jesus is and that's how I had a relationship with him and later on I moved back to Taiwan I was living in China and living in Taiwan for a few years to work and I got to work with our pastor in Taiwan uh, for a few months, and I've witnessed many students coming um, to know Jesus, to know the gospel, and God also transformed my heart for, for me to see that there are many lost people around the world. And right now, um, God has brought us here um, to Redditch, and he's continue, continuing to grow in me and shaping my heart. Thank you. going to pray now. Um, some of you know Nigel and Sam and Wyatt and Baxter and Texas. I want to especially pray for them. Um, they feel a great need for strength and protection. There's a 
a difficult circumstance they found themselves in. Um, so we're going to pray especially uh, for them this morning. And remembering too, as Jackie attends her sister's funeral on Tuesday. So let, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you that we can come to you this morning and lift up our voice in prayer. Help us then and stir us that each of us will join in quietly as I pray this morning. Thank you for the confidence that we have that when we come to you in prayer, through Jesus, that you hear us and we know that you will answer in your time and in your way. Pray, Lord, for Jackie and the family on Tuesday as they attend the funeral of Jackie's sister. Heavenly Father, I pray that there will be real comfort for them. And indeed, that each of them will, in consideration of their loss and in their grief, might lift up their heads, lift up their hearts to you, to look to you, to help them in their time of need and to find in you the strength, the unbreakable strength that you can give through Jesus. I want to pray this morning too for Nigel and Samantha and Wyatt and Baxter and Texas in the midst of their difficult and challenging circumstance. Heavenly Father, I ask that they will experience your strength and that you will protect them from any harm or adverse outcomes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to pray one for another. For Lord, as your people, when we are in Christ, when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and turn from our sins and seek to follow him. Father, everyone who follows Jesus is upon our own hearts and we long that they would know your help, your strength, your peace, your comfort. And Father, there are those perhaps whose circumstances are not known to us and yet are experiencing trials of one kind or another, or just the general stresses and pressures of life, circumstances, events that have been difficult for them to manage, and even now. Thank you, Father, that every heart is known to you. There isn't a single circumstance of any individual here this morning or of those who watch the recording online at a later point that is not known to you. And so I pray this morning, especially through your word, that you would speak to each and every one in a way that transforms attitudes, transforms each one's way of living to follow Jesus Christ. And Father, in our troubled world, surrounded by so much trauma, especially, Lord, we think of the conflict in the Middle East, and we know, Lord, that amongst those who live in Israel, amongst those who live in Palestine, amongst those who live in Iran or Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Jordan, wherever, Lord, you have your people amongst them. And Father, I pray that in these times of fear and anxiety and trauma that you would give to your people strength in those countries. And Father, we pray that you would humble the proud hearts of evil people who seek to oppress others in whatsoever way that might be, by political influence, by personal pressure and intimidation, or even in the so-called might of military power. Father, we pray you would humble 
proud leaders. And O oh Lord, we ask that peace might yet come in the midst of all the turmoil that they're experiencing at the present time. Pray too for those of your people, your church in Ukraine and in Russia. O oh Lord, will you help your people? Thank you that we can pray for them and seek to encourage them in one way or another. And we thank you for the work of the gospel in our own country. Thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. And we want to take full advantage of that freedom. And Father, I pray you continue to open the door for us to preach in Redditch Town Centre. Pray for this coming Saturday that the opportunity will be once again afforded to us in virtue of the weather and the circumstances, we pray. And we ask that those seeds that have already been sown faithfully, Lord, that you would bring forth fruit in its season. Oh Lord, will you pour out of your Holy Spirit in these days upon Redditch and the districts that are represented by each of us here and those, Lord, from other areas who may watch online. Father, hear us, not because we desire to be noted, but because we desire that Jesus Christ will be noted. He would be lifted up in the eyes of men and women. Help each one of us who love you to serve you well and to shine as a bright light in the ever-increasing darkness of our secular society. We pray, help us and work through us in our communities, in our workplaces, in our universities and colleges and schools and in our own homes amongst our family members, we pray. Give us wisdom, patience, strength and courage, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our next hymn is one by Michael Smith, You Are Holy. Nice to say.
Right, so we are reading from Acts chapter 10. It's a wonderful thing that God has his ways of bringing people from all nations into his kingdom, as we've heard from Julie in that lovely testimony. Am I on? Yes. Am I okay? okay. Um, And I think that ties in with this passage, I think we will see. So it's Acts chapter 10 and the whole chapter. At Caesarea... There was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up to me as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and the birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. 
But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gift to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses to everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptised with water? They have received the Holy Spirit, just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. We're going to sing again now. My soul will wait. And my salvation, 
your clocks back, in which case it's good afternoon. <laughs> uh, it's good to be uh, with you this morning, um, especially uh, as some of you know, uh, all you know I think, uh, nine weeks ago I had a bad fall um, and I've broken my spine, which is why I'm wearing this. Um, but as a result of that, I've had this uh, card that um, got all your signatures on there, so thank you so much. It makes me really feel uh, part of this fellowship and I uh, I felt the, the love coming out of this card. And I must say, I, I timed it very well because I haven't had to cancel any engagements here. Um, I'm back on my feet again. And um, in our first song, we sang the line, by the grace of God, we carry on. And that's what we do, isn't it? Um, we have our setbacks. Um, we pray for somebody this morning who uh, needs the grace of God. Uh, but by the grace of God, we carry on. And that's... Uh, how we uh, serve him, isn't it? It's not by our strength, but by the strength that the Holy Spirit gives us. The Roman soldier Cornelius, that we're going to looking at this morning, uh, said this, We are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And that's true every time we come, isn't it? So let's pray. 
Father, we're here in your presence to listen to everything that you have to tell us this morning. And Lord, we come humbly to do that. We come to hear your word. And Lord, we pray you may speak to each one of us here this morning as we bow our heads before you. Lord, we may hear uh, a different emphasis that's appropriate to us. And Lord, we pray your spirit will move among us. Lord, we pray you might minister to each of us individually. And as we hear your word, Lord, help us to not just hear it, but to respond to it and to act upon it by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, we're here in um, a series in the life of the Apostle Peter. This is number 11. If anybody can remember all 10, um, you could have uh, an extra biscuit later on. But uh, we are coming towards the end now. I think we probably are at the end. Um, and this is um, entitled Good News for Everyone. And that's what the Gospel is, isn't it? And that's what Peter had to learn, and that's uh, how he came to learn it in this uh, passage we're looking at this morning. It's great to have that testimony, wasn't it, from, from Julie, um, because she just proves my uh, opening line, which says this. When people come to know Jesus as their saviour, it doesn't happen out of nowhere. Now God is working in their hearts, and God is working in our hearts, um, before we know it. I mean, uh, I think Julie used the phrase, uh, God sowed a seed in my heart. And God is always sowing seeds, isn't he? And I'd be interested to hear all your different testimonies. We haven't got time for that. Um, I expect some of them have been shared already. Um, I've, I heard Isaac's testimony online, and that was uh, a great thing to hear, uh, and to hear others. Um, God sows seeds in hearts. Even in a seemingly sudden conversion, things have been going on in the background, haven't they? And that's what you do, I know, in the, in the centre of Redditch, and I know what you do uh, through uh, your website and online. Um, seeds are being sown. And we don't know often what's going on, do we? Well, today we're looking at a, a groundbreaking conversion. The conversion of uh, the Roman soldier Cornelius. Uh, and I think uh, quite a few of his family and friends as well. Up to this point, uh, the church was almost exclusively made up of converted Jews. Which, of course, is what Peter himself was. Uh, the, who the apostles were. But right at the beginning of the book of Acts, when Jesus in his last appearance, really, to the apostles after he's risen from the dead, he's about to be ascend, about to ascend into heaven. Um, he announces to them that they are to be witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I suppose for us, Taiwan is the end of the earth, isn't it? But, um, and the gospel has gone there. And uh, my uh, my daughter, as you know, uh, is a missionary in in. Uh, in a rather remote region of Africa called Chad, and the gospel has gone there, right to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus promised, that's what Jesus commanded. And for that to happen, it meant that non-Jews, Gentiles in other words, had to hear the gospel and to respond to it. And for the Jews, that was quite a, a difficult thing. Because they considered themselves to be God's people, and they were God's people, God's chosen people, and perhaps exclusively God's chosen people. And to say they were not exclusively, there were, there were Gentiles, we know some in the Old Testament, like Rahab and Ruth, and others who had come into God's people, but it was primarily the Jews, wasn't it? They were God's people. And Jesus primarily moved amongst the Jews and preached to the Jews, and not, not exclusively. Um, but now they were to be God's witnesses to the Gentiles. And that was a groundbreaking moment. And I think that's why we have um, 
Jean, thank you for reading that long, long chapter. It's a, there's a lot of detail there, isn't there? Which we don't really need to go into all the detail. But it's given in, in fine detail because this was a groundbreaking moment, particularly for Peter. As we see, he had to have a special vision to even get him to do this. Because they thought that they were God's people alone. They had a big barrier to cross. We can see actually how Peter regarded the Gentiles when he mentions it in um, chapter, in verse 28. God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And that's how the Jews regarded the Gentiles, wasn't it? As impure and unclean. They, they had uh, all kinds of laws that separated them from everybody else. And that included the food laws. And of course the Jews still have that, still have that haven't they? Uh, what they call kosher. And they have those laws which, ex which they regard keeps them pure from everybody else. Like us who might have a bacon sandwich. Um, <coughs> or sausage roll, they, uh, everybody else is, we are the impure and the unclean in their sight. And I think there's still a bit of that going on in the Middle East right now, isn't there? Um, and that's how Peter regarded the Gentiles. That's the way he'd been brought up, that's the way they had interpreted uh, the Old Testament. And he had a big barrier to have to cross, so that's why God uh, brings this vision to him, isn't it? To, uh, to help him to see that the gospel is good news for everyone. Aren't we glad about that? We are, I guess, less probably totally, I don't know your background, but I expect most of us are Gentiles. We are the impure and the unclean. Excuse me for calling you that. Um, in the Jew side, that's what we are. Good news for everyone. And for people to receive the gospel, God has to work in the hearts of both the listener, the one who's going to receive the gospel, but also in the speaker, the evangelist. God has to work in that person's heart as well. And that's what's going on here, isn't it? There's two things happening at the same time. God's working in Peter's heart and God's working in Cornelius' heart. And eventually the two come together and when they do, wow, what a wonderful thing happens. Now this is a unique event, as I say, because it's the first time that the gospel has really reached um, the Gentiles. And so there are aspects in this uh, story which are unique to that occasion. They are not repeated. But there are principles that we can learn for our own witness for Jesus. So the first point, and really probably the main point, is the preparation to receive and deliver the good news. For the gospel to go out, there has to be preparation. There's preparation in the heart of the one who's going to receive the gospel, and there's also preparation in the heart of the one who's going to deliver the gospel. And when those two things happen, that's when the gospel has its effect. So first of all, Cornelius, the one who's going to receive the good news. Now Cornelius, we're told a number of times, uh, was a Roman centurion. May not seem to be a particularly promising um, target, if that's the right word, uh, to receive the gospel. The Romans were the occupying enemy, hated by the Jews. They were violent, extremely violent. They crucified Jesus. They crucified many people. They were the occupying force by violence. They were also pagan. They worshipped many gods. Not the people in Taiwan. Not the people in many countries. They were, they, they were the opposite of what you might think would receive the gospel. However, amongst them, there were people who were not like that entirely. And when we look at Cornelius, right at the beginning of uh, chapter 10, 
In verse 2, he's described in this way. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Where did that come from? It's not what you would expect, is it? Well, we know where it came from. God was preparing his heart. He was already on the way there, wasn't he? He didn't know the gospel, but he was on the way there. God was, had already been working in that man's heart. To look at him, to see him marching with the Roman soldiers, doing what Romans did, you probably wouldn't even have known what was going on inside. And there's people all around us and we don't know what's going on in our hearts, do we? God is at work. But it's unseen at that point. And we're told he's a good, he was a good man. He gave to the needy. He gave money away to the needy. He was regular at prayer. So why did he need the gospel? Because a good life is not enough, is it? There's plenty of good people in Redditch. Plenty of good people in, in Worcester, where I live. But they need the gospel. Because living a good life will never get us into God's presence. Because there's still sin in our hearts. And sin has to be dealt with and paid for. And as Paul says in the letter actually to the Romans, the wages of sin is death. He was a good man, but good is not enough. So an angel appeared to him and says, "Yes, you are a good man because of your good life. I'm going to send. Uh, I'm going to send poor Peter to come from Joppa to you. Peter is God's man. Peter is the evangelist. Peter is the apostle." Peter will bring the good news. And that was God's initiative. God did that for Cornelius. Nobody else knew about it at this point. Unseen. We can't create what God is doing in people's hearts. We can't even see it to start with. Jesus spoke to a man called Nicodemus who came to his house at night. He was a seeker. God was working in his heart. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. It's a mysterious thing, isn't it? Somebody wrote to him, God moves in a mysterious way. We don't know what God is doing in people's lives. It's God do. We can't create that. It's the work of the Spirit. What we can do is pray for it. Ask God to do it. But we can't actually do that. God sows the seeds in people's hearts. Just as he did in Cornelius. However, God uses us as well. Someone had to tell Cornelius the gospel. The angel could have done it, couldn't he? No, the angel told him to go to Joppa, but he said, no, the angel said, you, this is what you need to hear, this is the gospel. And there are people I've heard about, I think particularly Muslim people, who have, who have visions, uh, and God appears to them, and they respond to that. But God has chosen to use his people to deliver the gospel. And that's everybody sitting here and me standing here. We have a job to do as well, don't we? And I know you're doing it because I've seen the, I've seen the picture up there. But also um, I can see it happening here too.
And God had a bit of a job on his hands, if I can put it that way, because uh, he had to overcome Peter's prejudice. So he gives him a vision. A large sheet comes down and we're told that Peter was hungry, maybe that was a, a supernatural hungry, but the, but the hunger, but the sheet came down and all kinds of animals were in it. Um, and this would have horrified uh, uh, Peter because uh, apart from the, the nice things like the lamb and, and the beef and so on, uh, the meat that he could eat, uh, there were reptiles, I don't know, there were snakes and, uh, and lizards and things in there, uh, and there were birds. Um, and Peter said, I can't eat those, I've never eaten those things. No, I follow God's law, I follow God's rules. Um, I never eaten anything which is unclean. Surely not, Lord, he says. Don't ever say that. We can't say surely not and then put Lord on the end, can we? No, I can't go to that person with the gospel. Lord, you, you know what he's like. How can I possibly take the gospel to that person? They will never respond. I've, I've tried before and they've just slammed the door in my face. I can't, I can't go there. Surely not, Lord. <coughs> if you're going to say surely not, don't put Lord on the end. Because if he's your Lord, then just say surely. It's one thing or the other, isn't it? And the voice from heaven said, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. What a statement that is, isn't it? Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. God transforms the most unlikely people, doesn't he? People we think that person could never, ever become a Christian. They're too far down the road. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. If God has changed my heart, he can change anybody's heart. If God has changed your heart, he can change anybody's heart. If we're honest, we're all impure. We're all unclean before God, aren't we? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in exactly the same position. Some might feel look worse than others, but before God, all have sinned. God opens the door for the gospel to reach everyone in that vision that he gave to Peter. It was repeated three times. Everything happens to Peter three times, I think. Um, it takes a while to get through his skull. But uh, it's repeated three times. Peter needed to be persuaded. And he's wondering what this vision is all about. He doesn't get the message straight away. Verse 19. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Everything happens to Peter in threes. <laughs> three, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So Peter finally gets the message. He's seen the vision. He's seen the visitors. He's going to take the gospel to Cornelius. The two parties have come together. They've both been prepared by God, by the angel, by the vision. And this is God's timing. He brings the two together. And they have a meeting and they both explain how it's happened, what God has done for them. So that they both see now God's not just working in their heart, but God's also been working in the heart of the other one as well. Key verses for Peter, verses 28 and 29. Peter says, You're well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. That's not a very good opening, is it? You know, um, I've come to your house, but I shouldn't really be here. You know, I had to have my arm twisted to come here. I mean, it's not the most um, diplomatic of, of uh, opening conversation, is it? But that's what he says. But then he says, 
But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So it's not, not, not the, uh, the most diplomatic way of talking to Cornelius, really, is it? Implying, no, he's impure and unclean, but God's forced me here. Um, we may not you know, always get our words right when we share the gospel, might we? Don't, don't, don't worry if you, if you come out with the wrong words. Um, Peter did. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. Well, actually, he did raise an objection, but never mind, he, he'd forgotten that. Because um, he said, I don't, I don't eat anything unclean. I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you were sent for me? That was Peter's side. Cornelius says in verse 33, I sent for you immediately. He's far more responsive, actually, to God's word than Peter, isn't he? I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you, of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. There's more, more godliness in Cornelius' side than there is in Peter's side at this moment, isn't there? Um, and yet, uh, God has brought the two together. They've both been prepared. Let me tell you about my, my neighbour, Derek. I've, I've told this story before, so uh, uh, excuse me if you've heard it before. But um, I'm the world's worst evangelist, so I haven't got many examples to share, so uh, I'll have to share the same one. But uh, down the road from where, where we live in Worcester, when I was in our road in our estate, um, a, man lived, a man called Derek lived just a few doors down. And when we, uh, when we moved to Worcester, I took over uh, distributing leaflets from the church. We used to give them out at Easter and Christmas and other occasions. Um, 140 houses from where, where we lived. And the lady who um, I, uh, I, I took over from said, uh, don't put them through the door at number 26. Uh, he's got a, uh, a notice on his door that says, no religious leaflets. She said, I've tried to talk to him about Jesus and he, he won't have it. So don't put anything through his door. So for 14 years, I passed by number 26 and never put anything through the door. Uh, then one day we were out walking uh, and we met Derek. Uh, and he said to Jean and I, I've just been diagnosed with inoperable stomach cancer. Um, and I've got no one to look after me. He was a single man my age, ex-army. He was a good man, he was like Cornelius. He went around doing good, he, he helped people. All the people in our road, he helped, he helped us um, repair our shed and repair our fence. He did, he did lots of good things. Um, no religious leaflets on the door. So we said, no, um, oh, we'll help you. Not knowing how, <laughs> not knowing <laughs> what we could actually do. And so we make these promises, don't you? Um, but he had actually lots of, la lots of ladies around where we, who would help him practically because he, you know, he helped all of them. And then a little bit later, I was uh, on my way to church. I had to pass his house. Uh, Jean had already gone ahead, so I was on, on my own. And he was out in the front garden. And I don't know why I said this, but I said to him, uh, Derek, I've got my Bible here. Would you like me to come and read it to you? And to my great disappointment, he said yes. <laughs> and I thought, what have I let myself in for here? I can't, I can't go in there and talk to this man about... about um, anyway, I, 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 I said I would, so a couple of days later I went back. Um, and it was coming up to Easter, so I went in there and I read uh, the account of uh, the uh, cross and resurrection. And I discovered, actually, that Derek had been on an Alpha course. Wouldn't expect that, would you? He'd been on an Alpha course. And he'd been told on that course he could ask any question he liked. Um, and he asked any question he liked, and they just shut him up and wouldn't answer them. Um, because the leader sort of his set script, and he couldn't uh, uh, di divert from that. Um, and that had sort of put Derek off, really. Um, so um, I said, well, you can ask me any question you like. I may not be able to answer it, but, but you, I'll do my best. And so um, I went back and started reading the Bible to him regularly. And he, um, I started reading John's Gospel. I don't recommend that. I never realised how difficult John's Gospel actually is. When I started reading it, actually I missed out one or two bits. Um, but I started reading John's Gospel. 
to Derek, and Derek just lapped it up. And um, we got to chapter 11, um, where Jesus says to uh, the raising of Lazarus, and Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection of a life. He who believes in me, even though he die, yet will he live. Do you believe this? And I said to Derek, do you believe this? And he said, yes, I do. And then we went on to John 14, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and it says, um, I will come back and take you to be, by my, to be with me. I mean, Derek is having chemotherapy. You know, he's going downhill at this point. And... Um, I said, one day I'm going to read that again to you, Derek. Um, and we just about got to the end of, of John's Gospel um, when he went into the hospice. Um, actually, one where, where, where Joe works. Uh, and we went, in, went into the hospice and he, he, was, he was on the bed. He couldn't speak. He was so, so weak at that point. Um, and um, I held his hand and I said, uh, you liked me reading the Bible to you, didn't you, Derek? And I said, I'll come back and I'll read this to you. And I read those same, same words. Um, Jesus says, I, I'm coming back to take you to be where I am. Just squeezed his hand. And that's the last time I saw him. And he never said the sinner's prayer. He never went to church. He wasn't baptised. But then there was a dying thief, was he? And yet I believe God prepared his heart and God prepared my heart. And the two came together. And that's what it is, isn't it? And that's what we pray for. We pray for God to work in people's hearts. He was the only person on that estate who didn't receive any leafage from Wood Green. And yet the Lord, <coughs> the Lord took him to himself. You know, just like the Roman soldier, you wouldn't expect you wouldn't expect God to work there, but He did. So that's the preparation. Now, much more briefly, proclamation of the good news. They came together, and then Peter just preached the gospel to them. And actually, um, it's in verse 34 onwards. Um, it's very similar to the Pentecost message that Peter had preached to the Jews, because actually it's the same message, isn't it? Slightly tweaked around because it's a slightly different audience. But it, there's three main points. Verses 36 to 38, Jesus lived a life of doing good. And it's interesting, a Roman centurion, not Cornelius, but another one, found all that. Jesus did good for a Roman centurion. He healed his servant, didn't he? He was one who looked after the Jews, and God worked among him. Maybe Cornelius knew that centurion. Peter says, you know about Jesus. How did Cornelius know about Jesus? He said, verse 37, you know what happened throughout the province of Judea, how God anointed Jesus. Jesus was well known even amongst the, the Roman soldiers. So he said, this is a man that God has, this is who Jesus was, this is what Jesus did. Then he was crucified. There was a Roman centurion there as well, wasn't there? Standing by the cross, maybe centurion, maybe Cornelius knew him as well. He was crucified. God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses to that fact. That's simply telling him about Jesus. And we... That's what we do, isn't it? Jesus was a good man. He was God's man. He did miracles. He healed people. Then he was put to death on the cross. And God raised him from the dead. Why did that happen? Here's the crux. Verses 42 and 43. We, Peter said, We have been commanded to preach to the people and testify that the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We all must appear before the judgment of God for the sins we have committed. All our good deeds can't pay for our sin. But Jesus has paid for our sin. Jesus died on the cross. A perfect man took upon himself 
the punishment for our sin. God accepted that and proved that by raising him from the dead. That's what we share, isn't it? That's the good news. We can't change people's hearts, but we preach that not knowing whether God has prepared a heart or not. But we preach that and are with those hearts that are ready to receive it, just like Cornelius. Maybe the unexpected people, the one who we thought like the man at number 26, he's never going to want the gospel. How can you say that? How can you know that? When Jesus went around Galilee preaching the good news, who were the most unresponsive people? The religious leaders of the day. Who were the people who responded? The Roman soldiers. God moves in a mysterious way. And still does today, doesn't he? The gospel was proclaimed. The hearts have been prepared. The gospel was proclaimed. And the power of God was released. The Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit in a unique way. The Holy Spirit came down on them. You know, Peter was speaking. And then God interrupted the message. Peter had more to say, but God said, no, you, you said enough. You've given them the basics, that's enough. This is only a summary, I'm sure more was said. But then the Holy Spirit came down upon, upon all who were gathered he came in just the same way as a Pentecost, just to show that just as the Jews have received the gospel, now the Gentiles are receiving the gospel. That was a unique manifestation of the Holy Spirit to show that there's, um, God has no favourites. There no, there's no difference between any religious background or no religious background. So Peter says in verse 47, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptised with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Baptism just included them as part of God's people. They were exactly the same as the Jewish believers. No second class converts. Some tried to have them circumcised later on and that was shown... Um, that was not necessary. They're not keeping the law anymore. They've, they've been included in God's people. So what does it say to us? Is God preparing your heart? Is God preparing your heart to receive things that you have not yet received? Is God preparing your heart to go out and share the gospel? To look for those who are ready to respond. That's the challenge, isn't it? You know, Peter had to go out of his comfort zone. He had to widen his vision to go and share the gospel with Cornelius. Cornelius was ready to receive the gospel, but he could only receive it if somebody told him about it. God does the unexpected for his glory. So we need to pray, don't we? We can't start the process and we can't actually finish the process. We can't, we can't create Christians. The Holy Spirit does that. But God in his wisdom has chosen us to share the gospel, to sow the seed, <clears throat> I haven't written this down, but there's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, In the morning sow your seed, and in the evening do not withhold your hand, because you don't know which will prosper. We had a, a baptism in our church recently. Uh, two young men, one a teenager, one a student in his early 20s, both of them from non-Christian homes. Um, and 
people in, young people in our church have just invited them to a meeting and the, um, they've just done that and then there's sort of been chance meetings of them. There's happened to, one just happened to meet him again on the railway station. Just chance meetings, uh, but the seed of sown and bore fruit. There are other young people in our church who have grown up in Christian families, come to church every Sunday, they've been in Sunday school and they haven't yet responded to the gospel. I expect you've got situations like that as well. We don't understand, do we, how God works. Some unlikely, others likely, and it doesn't happen. It's the sovereign will of God, and we have to uh, respect that and bow to that, but we just sow the seed as far as we can, as plentifully as we can, and God will have his harvest. Amen. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is uh, one that perhaps younger folk here won't know. But those of us from an older generation, it was a favourite. Uh, God will take care of you. shall we? Heavenly Father grant that the word that we have heard might indeed lodge deep within our hearts and we ponder it and respond to it. We thank you for the good news. Thank you that the good news was shared with many of us and that we have believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and know our sins forgiven. Will you grant Father rich, a rich fruitful harvest in the Redditch district and elsewhere, we pray in these days. 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm sure you will have had something to take away with you from what you've heard today. And I hope you'll join us again next week when I will be sharing from God's Word. Look forward to you joining us then. God bless you.